In the Horizon Report 2016 K-12 edition, it identifies online learning as one year or less time frame for adoption into schools. Online learning in schools in the forms of blended learning has been on teachers' radars since it was actually featured in the 2014 K-12 Horizon Report. So where are we at? How are we going? In this virtual forum, we will explore various aspects of online learning using some of the discussion starters as presented in the Horizon Digital Toolkit. Welcome to our online learning forum for this particular evening. I'm Karen Bonanno and I will be your host and one of the panellists for this broadcast. Before we begin the session, I just need to cover some <clears throat> basic operational matters. Please note that the views and opinions that the panel shares with you are our particular views and perspectives coming from our own experience, from the research that we've done. And you will need to take this information and consider how it will apply within your particular work environment, whether that be a school, whether it be a workplace, or whether it might even be an RTO. In addition, uh, EduWebinar does not give permission for any capture recording or reproduction of this webinar in any format unless you have prior permission. The panellists for this broadcast I've got with me as guests th this evening um, is Dr Jenny Bales, who's an adjunct lecturer at CSU, myself as National Director for EduWebinar, and June Wall, who is a consultant with June Wall Consultancy. And I'm going to just introduce each of these people to you so that you can get some understanding of uh, where they come from and their background and the information that they would bring to this particular uh, forum. Jenny is an adjunct lecturer with CSU and so for her situation 100% of the courses are distance education and they're online. Jenny also works in an online space for the CSU for their listserv, AusTLNet and also their Facebook and these are useful tools to connect the community. Her background is that uh, when she was involved in teaching she was an online learning support teacher for years 9 and 10 students and they were enrolled in the Tasmanian eSchool. Jenny's role was to provide the face-to-face -face contact with the students and to also be that um, connection between the students and the online teachers when any difficulties arose. She's also involved, has, has involved herself in some ongoing professional learning, the CSER MOOC uh, Digital Technology Online course and she was able to then see the, how that platform worked and the different tools. Jenny's also a regular presenter for us at EduWebinar and also a participant. And her doctoral research uh, gave her that extra perspective in investigating primary school students working in a collaborative text-based online environment. And depending on the collaborative practices, it's a key component in the early stages. So we've got myself and as the founder of uh, EduWebinar and I've been involved in online professional learning development and delivery for over five years um, in this capacity. The platform itself hosts webinars that cover topics relevant to teaching and resourcing and curriculum design. Also I've participated in a number of online courses as part of my own ongoing professional learning and these particular um, experiences do provide some insight into that online learning world. Back in 2004, um, I also managed and delivered the inaugural online conference for the Australian School Library Association in a very different environment in that early stage and then did so again uh, for their 2006 and 2008 um, online conference. June, as an educational consultant, works in the e-learning space with schools, also registered training organisation and universities. Her background is that she has designed and built online courses for students in a secondary um, context, particularly with specific subjects of science and cross-discipline, looking at research and inquiry. She's also facilitated and mentored the students in those courses. She's also been a consultant for RTOs on instructional design for blended coursings. She's written uh, a master's course that's been delivered online and also uh, been a subject coordinator with the master's course, again delivered totally online. She's also uh, presents seminars for teachers on de developing and building online courses and like Jenny and myself has undertaken online courses um, across a variety of platforms. So there um, you have, we have our three panellists for this particular session. What inspired us to get this underway um, was the 
uh, Horizon Report Digital Toolkit. And that came out after the actual Horizon Report K-12. And the idea behind this is they wanted people to engage their community to start looking at some of the questions around a lot of the things that were happening as ed tech predictions, either short term or long term. So things like coding as literacy, uh, maker spaces, robotics, authentic learning, all those sorts of things. And so for us, for this first virtual forum, we're going to be looking at the online learning space. So I'm going to kick off the uh, process, first of all, by taking the question from the discussion starters in that toolkit. And the question I'm going to be looking at is what steps can we take to improve current online learning programs? What I'm going to actually look at is some of the essential skills that students are going to need around um, a number of categories in an online environment. And the reason why I see these as something that we may need to improve is they're often called soft skills within school, the school sector. And the soft skills aren't explicitly addressed in a curriculum. And so we need to think about these. The four categories that I'm going to look at um, are self-direction and self-discipline, learning preferences, technology, and the study environment. Taking the very first one, I've got three skill development aspects here. The first one being time management. It's very important for a learner to take charge right from the start and establish a manageable study schedule. They also need to be disciplined in this to be able to get to the end. And the discipline also requires them to look um, at setting some sort of a goal as an online learner because they're going to be juggling um, social, family, extracurriculum activities, and also their commitment to uh, their face-to-face -face work in addition to this online. And that commitment will require them to familiarise themselves with the platform. They'll have to be reading and viewing the course material, recording dates for when things are going to be happening, setting some reminders for them, and also uh, taking time to be regularly engaged in the discussion activities. One study that I found uh, the students in that online environment, they found that it was helpful to schedule uh, time for their study and also time for online daily activity. And they did relatively a 80-20 mix of that. They found that by doing this, they could avoid the procrastination and they could also commit to logging in every day and check what was happening. So time management skills are extremely important. Problem solving skills are the next aspect because in this environment you will need to be able to uh, step up and solve some of your own problems or be willing to seek help. And when you have a problem you need to speak up, be explicit about it and other people in your environment are quite likely to help you as well. The next skill under this self-direction is self-motivation and that means that um, for doing this one student in the study said for them they were motivated by keeping an eye on the prize and for them it was getting a good grade. So it's important to have an end goal in mind and to have a big why for why you would undertake a course. In the next section, uh, the category under learning preferences, there are a number of skills that are here. First one is learning skills and that means if the learner can know their dominant learning style, whether it be visual, auditory, kinesthetic or read-write, analytical, then they are able to be more of an active learner. It also helps them to know that they have uh, other different learning styles, a little bit of that uh, available for them to draw on to survive. But in this environment, they're going to be exposed to uh, video, podcasts, text, quizzes, workbooks. So they need to be active and flexible and be aware of their particular learning skills and learning styles. Communication skills are also extremely important because they're going to be working in asynchronous where there's delayed um, discussion forums or synchronous where it's real time, where there's interactive classroom chat or there could be video conferencing sessions. All of this of course allows them to engage in richer discussion but they need that variety and they need that agility to be able to cope in those environments. Collaboration skills are really important because they're going to be collaborating with classmates either on tasks or in the interactive discussion forums and there needs to be this give and take environment for them to be able to survive. They will be asking questions, 
contributing to um, informative responses. Um, in the study that I referred to previously, the 52% of the students indicated that they benefited from that interaction and they also, uh, around about 15 to 20% said that they also benefited from reading responses. So that was the give and take and it's all part of that collaborative activity. And given our global and digital nature of our environment that we're in today, uh, this is important for kids to develop um, these collaborative skills. Then the netiquette skills, and I think um, most of us would be able to identify with these, uh, respect others, no sarcasm, be thoughtful, encourage others, expand ideas, use appropriate language and be courteous. When we come to technology, uh, I think here all of this can be all put into one thing and that is that basic computer skills are needed. They need to know how to, how to work within the environment and how to navigate through it, how to deal with forums and video conferencing and chat platforms. They need to know things like file naming, uploading files, converting documents to PDF, um, even if the uh, online environment has a blogging platform as a reflective tool. Then of course the advanced searching, being able to go beyond just Googling it to being able to know how to conduct a search either via the web or databases. And then of course there's the hardware and software that's all part of that. Now this next one is uh, not necessarily skill based but it's important to keep in mind uh, as a component for improvement and that is making sure that the student does have a dedicated space, that they can avoid distractions whether it be um, their mobile phone or social media or games or even TV and also the important part about considering the ergonomics making sure the uh, height of the chair is correct, the keyboard and screen is, is at the right angle, forearms and thighs should be level and parallel with the floor, wrists shouldn't be bent when typing, good lighting, comfortable seat, making sure that the lighting in the room is at least as bright as a computer screen to avoid the eye strain. So I went through those pretty quickly, so I'm going to actually give you here um, a online learning readiness questionnaire and this is put this is put out by a particular university and it's quite handy. They've got a few other categories there. But if you wanted to even check in on yourself, you can go and uh, do this little questionnaire and then it gives you a report. Um, now, unfortunately, the links within the report to things like time management handouts, effective listening techniques or whatever it might be, um, isn't um, active. It doesn't take you to the right right places, but you can get an, an output of the report. So I actually did it for myself and it was quite interesting to use it as a reflection on uh, my particular learning. So I've gone through those at a particular pace, but I want to then just see whether we have any questions coming in or whether you might want to have a think about that to be able to then say, well, you know, what is it that you at your school need to improve in your online learning spaces? What I'm going to do now is actually um, swing over to Jenny. So Jenny's question, um, there you go. It's over to you, Jenny. Just make sure you unmute yourself. I'm just doing that. Sorry for the slight pause there, people. So I'm uh, taking on the perspective of the importance of having a facilitator to assist students in their online learning. And although my current experience is from a tertiary perspective working with master's level students, what I have learned over the years working with primary school and secondary age students has actually proved to be extremely useful in this higher education environment as well. Because I believe that facilitation can make or break the successful engagements of students in an online environment. And the first thing that I did want to talk about was the, the need with anything that you do with students if you're working in an online thing is to have a presence. That they need, to, if they can't actually see you, you might be working with students that are working in a classroom or facilitating an online project a global project where you've got students that are connecting from around the world, if you remain a stranger to them, then it is quite possible that you will never build a, a feeling of trust, camaraderie and collaboration that will support students to share their ideas with you, to feel comfortable asking questions of you 
and that underpins the beginnings of them becoming collaborative and cooperative with their classmates. So I've just thrown in there some things that I use with my students quite um, regularly when I start at the beginning of the year. I have more than one image of myself put in different places so they get to realise that I am a real person and sometimes I look better than I do at other times, that I have some personal interests like reading, collecting book figures, a view out of my study window, the fact that we have lots of little animals at our place and also my online presence. So I have a personal blog there and then one um, JV's Contemplations is my online presence and um, blog for within the Charles Sturt University workspace. So the students have opportunities to engage with me and to get to know me as a person and I think that makes a huge difference in how they will engage with me in the online environment and really it's very similar to what teachers do in a classroom that they establish their own presence with the students and that's the beginning of a successful working relationship for the duration of the, the school year or the course that they're studying. So just moving on then to some of the tools that can support facilitation and if you are looking at an environment or a purchase or that's free that you could be introducing into your school, there's a range of different tools that you might like to consider. So and I'm just going to run through these in terms of how they can actually facilitate collabor collaboration and support the students' learning. So some sort of announcement that goes out to all students at all time that's a little, perhaps a little more um, beefed up or accessible than just email because, so that it can be read within the online environment perhaps and maybe also uh, get sent by email. But if it's within the environment that you their learning, it means that students can go back to it and refer to it and use the announcements. And I use that as a weekly tool where it keeps students in touch every week so that they know that what's expected of them to maintain their study regime. Particularly important for those students who perhaps aren't as self-directed and disciplined as um, Karen mentioned earlier in terms of being a key quality for successful online learning. So it's the facilitator putting in some scaffolds to help students maintain a satisfactory level of engagement and progress through the subject that they're engaging with. Discussion forums are asynchronous, and synchronous, synchronous platforms and they can be just an environment where students go in and can just answer some questions that are set by the facilitator. It can be um, directly related to the content that they're exploring. And depending on the number of students that you have, the way you organise those forums needs to be considered as well so that you put in place things that will help students actively engage with the content and to think and then go beyond just making responses and to also um, not just answering the questions but responding to each other. So Karen referred to earlier that it's not just the learning that they get by articulating their understanding in response to a forum task but also reading other students' responses and then trying to create some sort of dialogue between that. So one of the techniques that I use with students if they have a task to respond to is that once someone's put an answer up, it's, we don't really want everybody putting up the same answers, we want to start a dialogue, so to pull out one thread and expand it, uh, to ask questions about it, to perhaps add a supporting reading that they've found that, that will extend the post that's already been put up there. And students find that far more interesting because they're not all doing the same thing, that they can progress and build upon each other's learning. It's important with any forums that you have, any synchronous um, opportunities with students, asynchronous, that they are moderated. And with older students in particular, you can actually involve students in that moderating process, perhaps have a group, a weekly summary of the conversation 
need or to pull out main points to and perhaps to also actually encourage that ongoing feedback so you could assign a small group of students different group each week to look after the forums still needing the facilitator to keep an overarching look at how that's progressing one of the biggest challenges with i find with online learning is the feeling of isolation and synchronous communication that real time connection with students is a very effective way of overcoming that and there's lots of ways of doing that so you can have online meetings in some sort of video platform you can use skype you can use chat so skype is more for small group or individual catching up but it is important that those opportunities are offered to students and one of the advantages of online meetings of course is that if with the correct software they can be recorded and students who miss out in the meeting can tune in at another time. Chat's just as equally valuable for on the spur, spur of the moment contact. Students, if you provide a chat facility that they can just join themselves, make a meeting time and get in there themselves or schedule time when the facilitator is there just to field, often they're very small little questions that and often there's no questions at all, it's just conversation, but it makes those students feel engaged. Wikis are also a really useful tool for collaborative practices where groups of students can build ideas and, and address tasks in a shared collaborative environment, uh, virtually real time as well. So I guess one of the important things if you're looking for a platform is to have something that you can customise and add resources to that suit that relate to your to your subjects. Uh, within the CSU um, environment, you can bring in other tools, so uh, something like Digo or Delicious for uh, managing interesting web resources. If you set up an account where students can add as well, then it adds richness to their learning experiences and that sharing and engagement. Uh, using SurveyMonkey with the students, to get them to, to use it as well in terms of they could be surveying their colleagues to, their, to find out question, answers to questions in, in their learning materials. Uh, one of the advantages of the online learning environment that, that I'm engaged with at the moment is the fact that it does have analytics in, sitting in the background so you can identify students that are not engaged um, and may, may be falling behind and that provides you with a means to put in the outreach support s strategies to bring them back in and get help for them to, to catch up or find out what's impeding their learning. So looking at particular tasks that I might do as a facilitator or a guide or a mentor, I mentioned the weekly announcements. I think it's really important that students know that there's somebody there keeping an idea and an eye on how they're going, where they're at. In my time when I was working with grade 9, 10 students, they had an online teacher who may or may not have been available during their, their scheduled online time. And my role was we all came together in the same room so that they had that dedicated learning space that Karen mentioned where there were no other distractions. Originally the students used to work in the back of the classroom when there was another teacher teaching another subject and that was proved disastrous and that's where I became involved as the, the mentor in the school to support those students. And so if they had any technical problems, I was on site to help them. They could communicate with their online teachers through email and through the workspace that the education department provided, but they could also ask questions of me. And if they felt they weren't getting a fast enough response from their facilitator, then I could also put um, kick things into place to, to ensure that more regular contact was put in place. So I think that's an important aspect. Many schools are looking to outsource some of this, the projects that students get involved with and for them to be online and learning uh, without, the, without a teacher as such because the teachers um, 
an online teacher somewhere else. But I do think our students um, need someone on base that they can can work with if they're in a in a, um, primary or secondary level. The older they get, of course, the more independent they become, but also often the more easily distracted. So some sort of weekly task, I think, helps the students to stay on track and to make progress. And it's great if you can build in some sort of in active learning and engagement. So I always endeavour to do that with any online meetings that I might have a slide presentation and do pre be presenting content, but I have slides where I'm asking students to put information into the chat box, which we then look at and and tackle as part of our conversation so that they are contributing to those presentations. A really good idea is to start with an introduction form to let your students get to know each other if they're not working face to sort of in a classroom, if they're, they, they are all distance and, and remote, then provides a way for them to break down barriers and always be available for contact. The speedier the contact, the better uh, because I think we, we live in a very much a, a world where if you send an email, you're looking for a reply straight away, and if you send a text, you're looking for a reply straight away, and students more so the, live on the, the ends of their mobile phones texting each other continuously. So in an online learning situation, if they have to wait a week to get an answer, they will become disengaged very quickly. The last little point I just wanted to bring up quickly about the online learning design of when you are considering how you're going to put together any sort of online program in your school, you need to be focusing on not just the content of the program but the things that you're going to put in that will facilitate communication and facilitate collabor collaboration because that's how you get active learners that will stay engaged. The three challenges and these have been already addressed really by Karen, so I won't go through them in any more detail than what's already been said by her and myself, but some is support me mechanisms. Look for instructional videos or create them if they're needed for particular things. It's a host of material available now through YouTube and SlideShare, etc., that will support students to engage or even to learn some skills to use some of the different uh, tech tools. Ensure that there's scaffolding within the learning modules and you provide opportunities for different styles of learning so that there's auditory, visual and, and print as well. So put in a range of of options there for students to engage with content. Make sure that there's a relevance to the task that you're asking them to do and that they can see links between them and the, any assessment that they might be partaking in. And as I said, building those interactive components. And keep that online, real-time connections open for them for when they need them. So there are some subjects at CSU that in embed virtual reality into their programs. Just a little word on that and it refers back to something that Karen mentioned earlier as well, is depending on your location and who you're working with, not all students will have the NBN and or the, an NBN that's working really well and often uh, internet connection can be a hindrance if it's not up to speed with some of the latest technologies. So virtual reality is one of those challenges that I can't deal with in my location and I'm sure there would be other students that are in a similar boat if they're doing work from the home situation at least. And really that's all I wanted to say on this so I'll wrap up now and pass back over to Karen or June. Thanks Jenny. Um, the in that little online learning readiness questionnaire, they do have a section which uh, gets people to look at their computer equipment. And so they look at things like whether their internet's reliable, whether they have a printer, what type of operating system they're on, do they have virus protection. So there's a whole lot of things, as you say, run behind the, um, the whole online environment. It's not just the learning that takes place. So what I'm going to do is, um, Pick up now for June, and June's going to look at the question of how do you evaluate the success 
of current learning programs. So June, I'm going to swing over to you this time. Uh, so we're coming your way. I'm assuming, hi everyone, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen at the moment. Um, I just thought, I'm just, I suppose, reiterating what Jen has said uh, tonight in regards to your presence online. My presence online is, is there because of the need for people to be able to put a face and a voice, etc., to the whoever is helping them learn. But I also think, and this is what I'm trying to show you here, I think it's important to give people an idea of your personality, all right, what you're interested in. So consequently, my blog, because I also work as an adjunct at CSU, my blog is about online learning because that's the issue that most of my students have had problems with. So it is just to remind you that there are different ways that people look at you um, and each time you show a photo up there or an image of some sort, it actually gives another perspective on you. So it's really important in that respect. I'm looking at the how do you evaluate the success of our current online learning programs. The more I looked into this question, the more I thought I need way more than 10 minutes to answer this. So I'm really going to take you through a very, very fast roller coaster ride about what this actually means. So, in, and I will refer to some research, all right? So in summary, in, in research here, and I've got all these references at the end of my slide set, in this research it's basically saying that if we look at evaluating our current online learning, the way we evaluate normal teaching and learning, then it's unlikely to take account of the way that students learn in a connected world. So in other words, if we take our evaluation mechanisms of how we evaluate learning in a face-to-face -face world into the connected world, it's not going to follow through. So if that's the case, then how do we work out what type of online learning we're going to be talking about. Now, I've just thrown up there three different models of online learning, and some of it includes blended learning. I, you know, I'm not going to get into that at the moment, but it's really a matter of what type of model are you going to use, because that model of online learning will determine also how you evaluate the success of the current program. And, and more research from the US, and most of the research in online learning does come from the US, I have to admit, more research from the US basically says that students who work in an online environment are modestly better. So it's me that's modest, has had bolded the modestly word. They're modestly better on average. So it's unfortunately, from my point of view, with the way I learn and the way I teach in an online environment, I'd like to think that there's a lot more depth to the learning, but if the research is saying there's only a moderate or a modest improvement in learning, we have to seriously ask ourselves why, especially given the online learning being on the uh, Horizon Report K-12 edition as our 12 months, within 12 months of being in schools, all right? So if online learning is within 12 months of being in schools, but we've got no proof that there's a significant difference to learning, then we have to think about why we're asking that. We particularly have to think about it even further when we talk about whether, when you look at the Horizon Report's statement that, or one of its conditions, I should say, that personalised learning, which I see as hand in glove with online learning, but personalised learning is one of those wicked challenges so I'm not sure how aware you are of the Horizon Report, but it actually gives you levels of challenges. And Wicked is basically, this is a really hard challenge. So it's saying that personalised learning is a really hard thing to get right and to, get, to do, and yet it's saying online learning is only 12 months away. So if that's the case, we need to think about where we're going with it. So one of the things that I'd like to actually to you to think about is what is the purpose of the online learning that either you're delivering at the moment or you're building or you're participating in, whichever aspect of that you're on about, why is that an online learning environment for you? Is it part of the organisational demands? Is it because the learner has particular demands in it? What type of learning, in other words, what's the purpose of the online learning itself? Is it conceptual or knowledge driven? Is it competency driven? 
because all of the answers to all of these questions are going to determine how you build the online environment or how you participate in it. And I think Jenny and Karen have really covered that, that facilitation aspect, but it is really much a, very much about, especially in building it, is what is the learning architect, and that's what I sort of think of the person who builds this, what's the learning architect put together in the respect of how you embed mentoring and facilitation, which are different, I'm not going to go into the reasons for that, but how do you embed that? How do you embed personalisation for the students? So what is the purpose of your online learning? Because I would suggest whatever the purpose is, is going to determine how you evaluate the success of the program because the organisation could have success because it can measure those success in its metrics of um, people through the online learning program, people successfully completing the online program, a whole host of different things. But you've got to think about why you actually put them together. Okay? This is an example, this is some research again out of the US about what types of learning activities have been using digital technologies and where they fit. So you'll see that if you think about this, especially in a Bloom's uh, taxonomy perspective, most of the, I, the things that are happening, and this is a K-12 environment that this is reporting on, most of the things that are happening are at the lower end of it. They're not up the end of where the critical thinking, the creating knowledge, the sharing knowledge comes. So the research itself has concluded that the predominant use of digital technologies for learning were in understanding conceptual knowledge and not creating new knowledge. Now that's a problem when it comes to why we're doing learning, online learning in the first place. If we are looking at online learning as taking something from a face-to-face -face environment and delivering it into an online environment and we're not adding or enhancing to it, we're not taking advantage of the, the affordances of the web, the affordances of the digital tools, we're not allowing students to create new knowledge and to participate actively, then we really need to think about what type of online learning we're building. So we need to make sure that we're applying the learning theories that are appropriate to a digital age. Now, this is not the time for me to go into those sorts of theories, but you know, um, connected learning, networked learning, whatever you like to call it, there's a range of learning theories that are more appropriate to a digital environment. The, you know, Siemens, Rheingold, etc. They're the sorts of people you should be looking at in that regard. If you look at the likes of connectivism, connectivism with Siemens, with George Siemens, then and then look at your online learning environment. How does that work? How does that marry into it, or does it at all? And I'm suggesting that most of the online learning that we have is about transfer of knowledge. It's not about development of concepts or development of new ways of thinking. And so consequently, I think what we're doing is actually transferring our face-to-face -face environment into an online environment and not transforming it. So what are we evaluating? So you need to think about, are you evaluating learning success? Are you evaluating learning engagement? I would suggest that you need to evaluate learning engagement in an online environment because for many of them, that's, they've gone to an online environment because they're disengaged with face-to-face -face learning. Are you evaluating the success of the online platform or the tool or the tools, whatever you've been using? Or are you evaluating organisational outcomes? Because I don't think you can do everything when you look at and it, one evaluation strategy. All right, so think about what you want to evaluate. These are some of the basic evaluating strategies from Charles Sturt University for online learning in, and their teaching and learning. So what they've done here, have really probably covered off a lot of what Karen and Jen have been talking about previously. It's about making sure that students are really clear about where they've got to go, what they've got to do, how they're going to do it, and what level of feedback you're going to provide as that facilitator. So you could use, for instance, a university's, and as I said, this is just CSU's example, you could use a university's list of what you're actually looking for 
and this is what they base their surveys to students on for um, how successful the student thinks that their subject or their unit has been. You could base this as a checklist if what you want to know is the perspective of the student. But if what you want to know is the data, then this is not going to give you this because surveys such as this only give you the perspective of what the student believes, not what is necessarily what's happened. So this is why I'm trying to sort of just give, make you think, if you like, about the difficulty in, in actually answering this question because we really need to think about where, what we're going to be evaluating. For instance, I don't believe that it's possible to do an online course unless you are relatively digitally fluent. But, as you can see some of the data I've put on the screen, the research out of Pew, out of OECD, out of other research out of the US, all is basically saying that adult-wise, only 17% are digitally prepared. Millennials are nearly last in their um, capabilities of digital literacy. And then on top of all of that, most of the younger end of the population are all using mobile or wireless technologies. So that puts a different perspective on what you can expect the student to be able to do as well. Because we all know, and everyone online tonight would definitely know, it is different about what you can do when you're in front of a PC or a Mac or whatever type of device you use versus what it's like when you're on a mobile device. So you need to think about what sort of digital fluency those students have. And what is really interesting with the um, digital literacy report that um, New Media Consortium, in other words, the people who do the Horizon report, they've got a, a digital literacy report that they've just put out in October this year. And the basic bottom line of a 20-odd page document is there is no agreed definition of digital fluency. Now, that's, I think, especially important from our point of view as, as educators, whether we're developing within the online environment or teaching within it, is that what do we believe that digital fluency or digital literacy is? Where do we sit within that? So as you can see in this particular graph, adult learners, and again this is um, Pew Research Centre, adult learners, most of them when they've gone to do some type of a learning activity, they're still using face-to-face -face environments, physical book environments. They're, if they want an online course, it's lower end of the spectrum. When we look at New Media Consortium's variations on the theme of digital literacy, they've covered it off by saying there are three aspects of digital literacy you can look at. I'm not sure I quite agree with these, but this is what is coming out at the moment. So you need to think about what aspect of digital literacy in this instance that your students or your learners would need in order to successfully complete your online learning course. You need to think about what does an online learner look like? So this is one of those things where you say, what does it look like, feel like, sound like, etc. You know, so I'm suggesting, and these are just my suggestions, I'm suggesting that an online learner, a successful online learner, is one who is a deep learner. In other words, someone who really gets into the metacognitive focus of learning, someone who is a participatory learner, so someone who actually actively engages. And like Jen, I've had students in my, I teach in a different, sub, a different course than Jenny at CSU, but I've had students in my course who do not participate actively and it shows totally in all of their results. So you need to have someone who is actually going to participate actively. And I think, and this is what we also don't often see nowadays, is you need someone who is going to be an open sharer. And I'm not saying just within the environment of the digital course or the online course, but someone who's actually going to share out there in various forms of social media as well because that's what a true online learner, I believe, looks like. So you might like to think from your organisational's point of view, what does an online learner look like for your organisational school or educational institution? 
You also need to think about what delivery methods you're going to have. You know, are you going to, most of them, say she uses a Blackboard as its learning management system, many schools use Moodle or Canvas or there's whole hosts of different LMSs out there. How well does, do, does that particular delivery mechanism integrate the teaching and learning activities, the assessment activities, the marking of those assessment activities, collaboration, new knowledge products, you know, what aspects of blended learning have been included within it? You know, what's the component of face-to-face -face versus online? So think about those delivery methods as well when you're thinking about how you evaluate. I think most of this, especially with the scaffolds and I think the rubrics Jenny has already covered, but I'd like you to really focus on this pedagogical approach. What is it about online learning that makes it better than the face-to-face -face mode because I know that some organisations put online learning courses out because there's economic rationalisation or there's um, you know, less teachers available or there's distance available. There's lots of reasons for it but whichever the reason, you have to actually give value within it. So think about the fact that the value is in the pedagogical aspects of connecting, collaborating, creating and critically thinking. So how do you build those into your online learning focus? I've already talked about personalisation, I won't go anything more into that. Modes of assessment. Often I see online learning courses where they've taken the assessment that was in the face-to-face -face mode and put it into the digital mode. They may have actually made small adjustments to it, but really they're still asking and all of us at every institution are guilty of this. They're still asking for the basic essay as a written text format or they're asking for um, reflection with, again, it's a text format, replying through a blog or whatever it happens to be. So you really, I think, need to, we need to think about what are the modes of assessment that we're looking at that actually make the online environment more engaging and more critically aware for students. Because if they don't see it as a bonus, why would they bother? There's many studies started out there at the moment about the impact of learning on learning of online learning, but most of them are related to short term. There's nothing that's really long term enough to be able to give you a much better view of it. But in the, in the short term, it could be quite simple. Do the students meet or exceed the learning outcomes required? So for instance, if you were in a, a high school, um, as I've been in, in the past, I was the mentor or the facilitator for a software and design course in New South Wales, so it, whether those, those students, for instance, didn't have any access to the subject itself, so they were doing it in an online mode, there's no comparison there for them. But you might have the ability to actually offer a course that is done face-to-face -face and in an online mode and actually use them as a control group and a variable group to actually see whether there is differences there. I think what we need is more practitioner evidence of how students are meeting or exceeding the outcomes that they need. Jenny talked about it and I know I've also um, discussed this in the past, the dropout rate of online courses is really, really high. Not so much in the university level because people have had to pay for it, practically speaking, but in MOOCs the dropout rate is exceedingly high. So why does that happen that way? Is it because the course has just been transferred from face to face? Is it not engaging? What's the reason for it? Too soon, I think, to tell, but we need to examine those aspects. Another piece of research has actually worked on a digital age learning matrix, and you might like to think of this as your rubric, so to speak, as to how you could evaluate your online learning. Okay? So, Beyond this digital age matrix is talking about accessing, presenting, processing information and then thinking about it as it goes across in roughly speaking in a, in a hierarchical order close to being blooms again all right, as you go across. So you could look at this and think about how does that fit within your online learning. So how do you evaluate the success of our current online learning programs? 
I think, and these are anecdotal comments from me, the positives of our current learn, online learning programs are that it has demanded, and tonight's an example of it, professional dialogue amongst us as educators because we cannot talk about it or we can't operate it, we can't propose it, we can't even think of it as an alternative if we have actually haven't talked about it. It is meeting the need of a small proportion of students and I'm saying that in the respect of a K-12 environment, the distance ed mode, it's actually meeting an, a critical need there because of students who are in uh, regional, rural, distance areas or they're in a school that can't offer a particular subject. I've been involved in a number of with a number of students, you know, doing, for instance, textiles in one school where the school didn't offer textiles. So it is meeting those needs. And in that respect, they are the sorts of environments that are just the on the face-to-face -face course transferred into an online mode. That's a very different reason for the why they're doing the course in the first place. It does provide learning opportunities to a much broader proportion of the population. So if we're looking at it from an RTO's point of view, it actually gives, it gives the organisation, the RTO, the possibility of providing it and reaching a much wider audience and giving a more personalised process for their audience. The negatives, and I think that these two, I'm, I'll talk more about the, first, the second one in a moment, but the negatives are really that it does polarise learners. I've found in discussions with a range of different people that people tend to either decide they love online learning or they hate it and they won't do one or the other. So if it's polarising them, then it's actually not meeting a need somewhere. So I see that as a negative. I'm also suggesting, and this is why I put the asterisk here, that it's not suited to mandated learning. Mandated learning in this instance is when the company or the organisation is saying to its staff, and I'm not thinking of K-12 people here, more thinking of, of adults, but if, it's, if the company or the organisation has said, you must do this because you must meet, for instance, a WHS learning need, then what it's doing is it, it actually doesn't achieve real learning. It, it achieves the ticker box, the rubber stamp. Because if people are forced into an online learning mode, they actually don't enter it with the right attitude and they tend to actually just do the bare minimum. In other words, they're not successful learners in an online learning aspect. So my, my two options to sort of think about here are that we need to make sure that when we're devising online learning environments or spaces that we match the learner needs more closely to the specific environments and we personalise it as much as possible. And as I said earlier, we've got to stop thinking transfer and start thinking transform. But in reality, if you are needing to currently evaluate an online learning program, these dot points I have here are essentially what you have to cover off on. You have to look at how that online learning program has actually supported students as they enter it. In other words, what they know about it, how they know they're going to get through it, where they can go and find information, where they can get feedback, how, how to use particular tools. All right? Then it comes down to the organisational and the design of the space. So usually we're talking obviously of a, of a web space. So it's got to look good. It's got to be not text dense. So in other words, it's got to have enough white space, enough graphical space, enough object space so that it engages the learner and makes them flow through from an eye to, you know, an eye point of view. It's got to actually be consistent with how it's organised on whatever page they go to so they know where they're at and how they can get to and fro. I mean, all the, the basic things of a good website are a given. I'm just assuming you will actually check that out. But from a learning point of view, you really need to make sure of those consistency areas. From an instructional design point of view, you need to think about what instructional design model you used. Um, many people use ADDI as their instructional design model, but that's not the only one out there. As long as it's got an iterative model to it, it's essentially going to be appropriate to whatever, you, whatever um, learner, user learner you have. And then look at the delivery itself. And I'm not even looking here at the technology behind it because it has to be a given that that's going to have a very strong backbone. 
What is important as well is the integration of the face-to-face -face and the online. So while we talk about online learning programs, at this point in time, it's, I don't believe it's going to be successful unless it's a blended component, not a totally online component. And a blended component here is where I'm talking about face-to-face. -face. I don't mean physically face-to-face, -face, but at least visually face-to-face. -face. So um, having some type of video conferencing available or the students themselves, if we're talking about Kate, um, yeah, years 11 and 12 usually, years 11 and 12, getting together as small groups, so enabling that small group. The schools that I've worked with and helped them design subjects into an online environment, that's exactly what's happened. With, they've had created mentor groups with for the students that they can get together in small groups so that they can help their own learning. So that integration of the face-to-face -face and online is important. The assessment of student learning, of course, is important, but it's really got to be something that is different from. So you're assessing their higher order skills as well. And I know this becomes difficult in curriculum areas where there are certain outcomes that must be assessed, so obviously they must be assessed. But you need to be think, looking at engagement as well. And then, of course, how, how easily or not you've evaluated or the feedback processes. And I'd just like to say, probably in closing, because I'm not quite sure how long I've taken now, probably in closing is that whatever evaluation methodology you use, so most people are going to use a survey or they're going to use um, focus groups, etc. always make sure that that evaluation is centred on the user perspective, not the technology perspective and not the teacher perspective. Because the success of an online learning program is totally about the end user. These are uh, further reading that I've put in here for you to have a look at. Um, you can get the particular links of these later. I recommend to have a good look, for instance, at that first one that I put up there, the Digital Literacy NMC Horizon Project Strategic Brief that came out in October. That's quite interesting. And some of the others might give you some ideas for how you can build a rubric because essentially what I'm suggesting here is the best way to evaluate your particular online learning program is to have a rubric yourself that then actually makes it consistent and standardised. So what I'll do is swing back to me because there's a couple of things I want to um, cover before we, we finish off and also too to give the panel time to uh, give some summary points. Both Jenny and June have mentioned platforms. Now this was one site I found quite useful and what I will try and do here is put the link into the chat so that you can um, grab and that and have a look at it later. So just fiddle around here, just bear with me as I'm sorting all of this out. Because in this particular um, site, they give the most popular, but there's a mix here of corporate and academic, but you can apply filters to be able to narrow it down. But one of the important things that I found useful here is that when you were to click on that like let's say um, take Edmodo, it then opens it up and gives you a brief video but also lists all the features and both Jenny and June have talked about um, certain aspects that are important to be able to have an effective online learning environment but also tools that support um, the learning and the facilitation. So that's just a website that you might like to have a look at if you're considering various platforms um, that you're, con you're uh, going to undertake. Uh, now what I'm going to do is just flip to the last part and I know we're going a little bit over our time but it's worth having a bit of time to say well where to from here because we've only looked at three of the questions out of that digital toolkit looking at steps that we need to take to improve uh, the role of site-based mentors, program facilitators, how we help students to achieve better outcomes and then how you're evaluating the success um, of current online learning. Uh, so I'll just give Jenny and June a chance to have a think about what they might want to say for closing statement but I'll come in first by saying just reflecting on things that uh, June said in particular that I really see that we are not addressing the whole soft skill development and because it is called soft skills. When I reflect on the reports that are coming out from the Foundation for Young Australians um, through uh, fia.org.au, uh, 
one of the, the latest one was the new basics, which is big data reveals the skills that students will need. And in that report, it talks about the enterprise skills. It talks about skills that are transferable across a whole range of environments, things like the problem solving, communications, creativity, digital fluency, digital literacy, teamwork, critical thinking, presentation. Um, they even mentioned financial literacy. But all of those, maybe except for the financial literacy, are all part of what it is to be a successful online learner. And I don't believe that we are addressing that well within the education sector. And the way forward, it's like where to from here, is that I see that it's necessary to begin to integrate that into the mainstream classroom learning, then moving into blended learning, online learning, so that um, you know students are getting that exposure because employers will be looking for this um, later down the track. And in fact, in the report that the uh, Foundation for Young Australians produced, it said that young people with problem solving, digital literacy and presentation skills are actually going to be paid more because they have these skills that the employers are looking for. And just to end off, uh, the latest report that they put out uh, is called The New Work Mindset seven new job clusters to help young people navigate. And that is even more of a richer report because it clusters jobs and it says these are the skills that students need. So if we can be smarter in the way that we develop our online learning environments and use it, using that to develop the skills, then we're actually providing a fairly strong foundation for good opportunities for young people. So uh, Jenny, have you got any sort of where to from here or closing statements that would, you'd like to share? Yes, just very briefly. Thank you, Karen. It was fascinating listening to June's con continuation of the, of the discussion and the evaluation aspects were really significant. Just wanted to wrap up just a couple of points. So. Karen's just talked about the skills that students need and I would argue that the facilitator needs that, that whole breadth of skills as well to be a successful mentor for online learning. And I do think the facilitation is a critical and essential component. So um, my last school where I worked realised that they actually needed to have a qualified teacher supporting those students in, in, the, real in the real physical environment to ensure that their online engagements were successful. And I think expecting students to engage with an online courses or projects, etc., without facilitation is fraught with difficulties. And I guess a, a final closing question or thought to, for you to take away with you is how uh, we could be putting into, into practice behaviours and skill building in the classroom, in a face-to-face -face classroom that would help students develop the capabilities, um, self-discipline and motivation to be able to work successfully online. Often there are pro students work online all the time with, from, from within the classroom, but they they are being driven by the the content and and presence of the the teacher there. So so how could we be harnessing the the skills that they're learning to help them take them into a wholly online environment? Because in the big scheme of things, when they leave the school, there's that's the skill set that they're going to need in their future learning and probably work environment as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jenny. Um, June okay. keeps you busy. Yes. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Jenny. If I've remembered what I was thinking of, I'll get that out. First thing I'd like to say is that Jenny um, emphasised the need for facilitation skills. Can I emphasise, added into that, that when you are a facilitator or a teacher in an online environment, actually developing ways of showing and thinking about and Taking on board empathy within that environment is really, really important. And it's not as easy to do as you might think. So thinking about how you can empathise with students when you're not in front of them, 
think about, you know, and not every teacher, for instance, or not every person, forget teachers, but not every person when they get into an online environment shows themselves to be the same as they are in real life. So sometimes they come over more abrupt. So thinking about if you're using facilitators or mentors, really consider what that soft skill set is of the mentor and really emphasize that point of Jenny's. My next point is really just coming back to my transfer versus transform comment again. And it really is nothing new, let me say, because all I'm basically saying is an extra little emphasis on what Ruben Putendera from the US with his SAMA model has been talking about for years now. So think about how we can actually make sure that your online learning is transformative as a learning op activity, not just another thing to do. Um, and secondly from that, and I've spoken, no, sorry, thirdly and finally from that, I think that when we come to evaluate current online learning programs, there are so many factors that you need to evaluate, it's actually not as straightforward as it may seem. Because, for instance, if we're in a face-to-face -face mode, the teaching standards in Australia actually give you a rubric to evaluate a teacher's capabilities. We may disagree about that, but whichever way we think, that's what we've got to actually base ourselves against. The universities and, and providers have, if you like, rubrics for what they believe is, is appropriate. But we don't have a rubric, if you like, or, or a scaffold that says, what does the learner actually think and how do they engage with the content? So we might need to think about how we can get that user perspective into the evaluation more. And I think that's probably about it for now. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So uh, th three different uh, perspectives, a few challenges uh, can be a quite exciting future ahead. Uh, if you want to connect in with um, either uh, Jenny, June or myself, then here's our links. I'll include this also in the email that goes out. So you can uh, connect in and, and make contact. We've all got our contact information there on our sites. Now just uh, to close off, thank you Jenny and June for contributing to the, the panel and for presenting your information. It just provides a richer conversation than rather than just one person covering this particular topic. Uh, so thank you for your time and for staying with us a little bit longer than our usual hour that we run for the webinars. But I hope that you are able to get some key information out of that that you can take away. So thank you for joining us and thank you for Jenny and June being on board as well. <laughs>